we still use many of the laws that were passed during Grant's presidency to prosecute insurrectionists. So the 900 or so people who have been prosecuted for breaking into the Capitol and attacking police on January 6th, those insurrectionists, they've been prosecuted under the 1871 anti-Ku Klux Klan law. So that's a big accomplishment by Grant, and we still benefit from it. The problem is Grant was not a great politician. Unlike Lincoln, he didn't give good speeches. He wasn't a persuasive figure in a political space. And so he had trouble building support for what he was doing, uh, even though he was trying to do what in the end, I think, were the right things. What was the role of the KKK at that time? So the Ku Klux Klan is formed at the end of the Civil War by Confederate veterans, first in Tennessee, in Pulaski, Tennessee, and then it spreads elsewhere. And there are other groups that are similar, the Red Shirts and various others. These are veterans of the Confederate Army who come home and are committed to continuing the war. They are gonna use their power at home and their weapons to intimidate and if necessary, kill people who challenge their authority. Not just African-Americans, Jews, Catholics, uh, various others. They are going to basically protect the continued rule of the same families who owned the slaves before in post-slavery Tennessee and post-slavery uh, South Carolina. And when we get to voting, they're often the groups that are preventing people from voting. The white sheets and the ritual around that was all an effort to uh, provide a certain ritualistic legitimacy mm -hmm. and hide identity, though everyone knew who they were. Oh, so that, that whole brand, that whole practice was there from, from, from the, the beginning. very beginning. Have you studied the KKK's history a little bit? I have, and there are a number of other historians who have too, so I've used their research as well. I'm kind of curious. I have to, I have to admit that my knowledge of it is very kind of caricature knowledge. I'm sure there's interesting stories and threads because I, I think there's different competing organizations or something like that. Of course. Within and the United States. And I feel like they, through that lens, you can tell a story of the United States also of these different They're groups. often business associations. I mean, there's a lot of work showing that they actually people join the KKK for the reasons I just laid out, but also because it was networking for your business. You gained legitimacy in the area that you, that you were in. So this, these were, community groups that were formed to help white business people. They helped white sheriffs get elected. Uh, what, what we have to understand, understand today is when we're debating policing, this history matters enormously, right? I, I have nothing against police. Uh, my cousin, one of my closest relatives, just retired from 25 years in the New York Police Department. Thank God he survived. I have deep respect. He's one of the best public servants I know. But what we also have to recognize as we respect police officers is that for many communities, in our country, they know this history. And the KKK in the 1870s and in the 1930s, you look at any KKK organization as I have in my research and you find the police chiefs are the KKK members, the local police officers, local judges, because it was how you became police chief. So the, these groups infiltrated some of the main institutions in our, in our nation. I don't even think they infiltrated. I think they were part of those institutions. The deeper question today in the 21st century is, uh, one, how much of that is still there and how much of the history of that reverberates through the institutions. And I'm making the latter point that it's not there that much now, but people remember it. Well, and and some people would even say it's not there at all, that there is not institutional racism and policing. Uh, but if, if that's the case, then you can also say that if there is not direct institutional racism there, what is it, the echoes of history still have effects. Of course, and, that, and, that's, and that's really important and that we have to take that seriously. That's not an excuse for people then saying nasty things about the police, yeah. but it is what we have to recognize. Look, I'm Jewish and there are certain um, elements of Russian behavior today I see in Ukraine that reverberate with the history of how my grandparents dealt with pogroms in Russia, right? Even though what Putin is doing in Ukraine might not technically be a pogrom, that history matters in how I view these issues. And, and that's a reality. Yeah, I had, I went to 7-Eleven recently. And uh, uh, what did I eat? I ate one of their salads. I'm sorry, I love 7-Eleven. I'm sorry. I ate one of the salads and got like terrible food poisoning. Oh. I was suffering for like four days. And now I can't, I love 7-Eleven. I love going to 7-Eleven late at night in sweatpants and just I escaped the world. I'm listening to an audio book. And now every time I pass that salad, for the rest of my life, I would have hate for that salad. So history matters, <laughs> even yeah. if the salad is no longer. 
have any bad stuff in it. It's probably the lettuce or something, whatever. Um, mostly for humor's sake, but I'm also giving a, a, a kind of metaphor that um, history can have an individual and a large scale society effect on, on human interactions, both the good and the bad. If you actually recommend to me offline uh, books on the KKK, they'll be really- Happy to. There were a few mentioned in, in, the, in the footnotes in my book here. And also in part, because I also want to understand the white nationalism, white supremacist, uh, Christian supremacist or Christian nationalism, all those different subgroups in the United States and elsewhere in the world. I'm a bit, my mind has been focused on some of the better aspects of human nature that it's nice to also understand uh, some of the darker aspects. Um, let me ask you sort of a personal question for, for me. Uh, do you think it's possible do you think it's useful to uh, do a podcast conversation with somebody like David Duke or somebody, so somebody that everybody knows? So it's not like you're giving a platform to, to somebody that's a hidden um, member of the KKK or like a, it's a sort of putting a, a, a pretty face on some dark ideas, but everybody knows. And so now you're just exploring, you're sitting across the table, maybe not in his case, um, maybe somebody who's an active KKK member sitting across from a person that literally hates me, Lex. Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating to explore I do too. that. I, I, I think uh, so long as what you are doing is not boosting someone, so taking an obscure figure sure. and making that figure now famous. Yes. Uh, but if it's someone who's already infamous <laughs> yeah, and it helps us to understand them, and if so long as your effort is to ask them tough questions, which you do, right? You don't you don't give them all the questions in advance. You don't have limitations on what you can ask. So long as it is a real interview, not pablum, then I'm for it. What I'm what I'm against is a softball interview yeah. that allows someone to sound reasonable when they're not. Uh, but the way I've seen you do this, when you've had figures like that, I won't name who I have in mind. But when I've seen that, is I I think that's I think that's useful because honestly. Uh, the historian in me and the citizen in me wants to understand. Um, my, my my Jewish grandfather always was the, the first to be against any effort to suppress anti-Semites because his view was he wanted to know who they were and he wanted to know what they thought so he could be prepared. And I also see, like, uh, perhaps as a historian, you may be able to appreciate this kind of thing. That's probably how you see the world, but there's several ways to see a, a human being like Vladimir Putin is an example. One is a political figure that's currently doing actions in the world, geopolitics internally, the politics of Russia. But there's also that human being in a historical context. And collecting information about that person in the historical context is also very valuable. Yeah. So you could see interviews with Hitler in uh, 39, 40, 41 as being very bad and detrimental to all that is good in the world. But at the same time, it's important to understand that human mind, how it, uh, how power affects that mind, how power corrupts it, how they see the world. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I would be all in favor, and maybe he will, if Vladimir Putin would sit down with you. Absolutely. I, I, I don't think you're boosting someone like that when you ask them tough questions. In fact, I think that's what we need to do. Those sorts of figures tend to insulate themselves from tough questions. So just to restate, I, I, I am for the Lex Fridman interview of uh, those sorts of figures. Yeah. I am not for the puff piece on Fox and Friends uh, where they just come on and they're asked, oh, isn't it, T tell us what you think of this. Yes. Tell us what you think of that. I, you know, so, but there, there's a balance there because a lot of people that interview somebody like Vladimir Putin, all they do is hard hitting questions. They often demonstrate a lack of knowledge of the perspective of the Russian people and the president. There's not an empathy to understanding that this is a popularly elected, uh, you can criticize that notion, but this is still a leader that represents the beliefs of a large number of people. And they have their own life story. They see the world, they believe they're doing good for the world. And I don't, um, that idea seems to not permeate the questions and the thoughts that people say because they're afraid of being attacked by the people back home, fellow journalists, for not being hard enough. Well, maybe. I think that's probably true. I think in my experience with interviewers is that um, a lot of them are really lazy. You're not, which is why yes. I like talking yes, to the, you. The, 
can I just say, okay, this is not you saying it. Can I just rant? If you're sitting across from Xi Jinping or from Vladimir Putin, you, you, you should be fired if you have not read like at least several books on the guy. The, the surprising lack of research that people do leading right, up to it. Right. So you need to be a historian or a biographer. You need to be the kind of person that writes biographies or histories before you sit in front of the person. Not a, uh, not a low effort journalist. And it's so surprising to me that I think they're probably really busy and it's probably not part of the culture of the people that do interviews to do deep, deep, like investigative. You need to be the kind of person that lives that idea, like see it as a documentary that you work on for three years kind of thing. Anyway, that, uh, of course, some journalists do do that and they do that masterfully and that's the best of journalism. But I think a lot of the times when the questions are, as you said, uh, out of touch with the society that person that person is leading, right. it's because the interviewer hasn't taken the time. And I understand uh, you can't be an expert on every subject, but you can do what you do, right? You, mm -hmm. you read my book to prepare for this, you look things up, you, you had, had a sense of the person you're talking to, and you put the time in to do that. Uh, this is what I always tell my students, right? The secret to success in anything is outworking other people. Be more prepared. <laughs> Right, what you show is like an iceberg. It's the tip of the iceberg, right? Is what what people see. It's all the work that goes on below the surface. And if you work hard enough, which I aspire to do, at the end of the day, just like an animal farm, you'll be like the horse boxer <laughs> and slaughtered unjustly <laughs> by those that are much more powerful than you. Because but you'll they, be happy when you're slaughtered. <laughs> you have lived for the right ideal, and history will remember you fondly. <laughs>